Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Let's pray. Father, I need your divine enablement today in order to explain the truths of this text. Father, you know how you have already used these verses in my life. And Father, I ask that you would use them in the same way in the lives of this entire flock. That we would be people that learn from those who went before us. That we would live the way that you desire us to live in this present age. Guide me and guide your people. Would you guide us from sleep, from distraction, from pride? And would you open our ears that we may behold wondrous things from your word? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. It was during my first or second year here, I got one of those dreaded phone calls in the morning as I was in my office. I found that a man from my former ministry had been found dead that morning, a father of five in his early 30s. He died of a drug overdose in a casino, casino bathroom. Of course, immediately my thoughts went to the times of fellowship and investment that I had in this man's life. The baseball games that we went to, the cookouts that we had at his house and my house, the, the driving him to a treatment program really to help him and talking to him about the Lord and overcoming this area of dominion in his life. The times of waiting outside his home because I knew he was struggling and trying to be able to catch him and encourage him to do what's right. He was a professing believer, but sin got the upper hand in his life. And at that point, his body was laid out on that casino bathroom floor. It was his life that was one of the ones that came to my mind as I considered the text that is before us this morning. Paul is writing to professing believers who were free in Christ, who had everything going for them, but they were flirting with sin. They were allowing it into their lives. They were overconfident. They were using their freedom as we found in chapter 8 and chapter 9. They were using their freedom ultimately to hurt brothers, to allow other ones to fall back into sin. They were using it as well to hurt potential brothers. They were hurting the gospel by the way that they were living. And what we're going to find out this morning is the way that they were living were now ultimately hurting themselves. In our text, we learn that freedom in Jesus Christ doesn't mean freedom from catastrophe. Just because you have Christ and just because you can confess that he has an eternal home for you in heaven doesn't mean that you are going to have everything work out perfect and that you are not under the potential of destroying your life on this planet. Sin can destroy our lives, whether you are a believer or not a believer. And you may be needing to be warned this morning to be extremely cautious to keep yourself from engaging in sin because sin is destructive. My flock here, you may be a professing believer. You may be a member of this church, but you need to beware of spiritual disaster 
that could come upon you due to your sinful choices. In our text today, Paul does three things. He informs them about something that they need to know. Then he warns them, I believe in four areas that they need to be cautious in, and then he provides the encouragement to them. Okay. What I'm going to do today is I am going to take half of that. Okay. I'm going to inform you and I'm going to begin to warn you with what Paul warned this Corinthian church. That doesn't mean I'm not going to give you any encouragement. I hope I do. But you'll need to come back next week because we're going to finish this message uh, next Sunday. But today we're going to begin to dive into this text by looking at how Paul begins to inform them about a very important truth. So number one, inform. Our text, as you will see, chapter 10, is connected to chapter 9. Okay, most of you know that the chapter divisions were not there originally. They were ones that, of course, people who were trying to help others find different places in the letter easily, they, they put those chapters and verse divisions. Well, it's all connected. In chapter 9, if you'll remember back to last week, it ends with a warning of disqualification due to lack of self-control. You can disqualify yourself if you don't control yourself. Paul didn't want the Corinthians, this church, to be disqualified in their spiritual lives. And so he calls them now to pay attention. Listen to what our text says, verse 1. He says, for I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea. So he's calling them, I don't want you to be unaware. That was a call for them to pay close attention. It was kind of an understatement. I don't want you to be unaware of this. You need this in the forefront of your mind. You need to pay attention to it. And what he does over the next three ver uh, four verses is he gives them a history lesson from Old Testament Israel. I love history. It's one of the areas that I love to read on constantly. And here we are exposed to the history of Israel. He says, I want you to teach you something from the life of Israel. All of us need to learn from history. It was written, in fact, as we'll find out later in the text, it was written for us. In fact, many of the events happened for us. Notice he begins by calling them our fathers. It's interesting, most of the Corinthians, that church, was probably Gentiles. However, the connection was this. This group of people was God's people in the Old Testament, and you are God's people now. The term, of course, all is trying to continue what was started in chapter 9. All, 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 all of them did this. And he's bringing them all together. And what he does in these first few verses is he calls them to learn from their older siblings. Those of you who have older siblings, you probably learned from their mistakes. As I thought, no doubt, there were numbers of things my brothers did. I couldn't remember a ton of them that he did, that I learned from. I did remember that you don't keep driving in circles with your go-kart. Because before too long, it's going to flip over on top of you. I, I've learned, I learned some important truths from my siblings, and no doubt you've learned some important truths from yours. But this is telling you to go back distant. And he wants all of you who are followers of God to go back and remember some of your siblings and learn from their mistakes. He begins by showing them of the incredible blessings that they had mutually. Both of them were given incredible grace. Did you notice what it said in verse 1? It says that they... Their fathers were all under the cloud. You say, what is that talking about? Well, this is referring back to your Old Testament 
Many of you who have read the Pentateuch, which is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, if you were to go back to the book of Exodus, the second book of the Bible, you would read about how God had taken a nation whom he had selected to be kind of the nursery from which his son Jesus would come. They were in bondage in Egypt, and he decides in his divine providence and grace and sovereign will He brings them out of bondage in Egypt and he takes them and begins to lead them to the Holy Land. And the way he led them was by a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And so this cloud begins, because they didn't know which way to go. How do we get there? Which direction should we take? And here, visually, God led them. These are true stories. And so they follow this cloud and it leads them ultimately to the banks of a sea. And it leads them through this sea. In fact, the sea, which is referred to in verse number one, is talking about the Red Sea, the events of which are recorded in Exodus chapter 15. And what does he do? He leads them through the sea. The the, the sea parts. And Moses and the people go through the sea and they get delivered from the Egyptians. Of course, many of you know the story how the water crushed the Egyptians afterwards. So he's painting this picture. All of our fathers were under the cloud. All of them were led through the sea. But then he says something very interesting. And I think he's starting to... Help them to make some connections. Listen to what he says in verse 2. And all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. So he says they were baptized into Moses. What was that mean? Well, they came under the leadership and under the sphere of Moses. They were united with him. And what I believe Paul is doing is he's beginning to start to allow them the Corinthians, to see similarities that they had with their older brothers of God. The Corinthians, just like the Israelites who were baptized into Moses, these Corinthians who were part of this church had been baptized into Christ. They had also been let out of bondage. They too had been physically baptized, but it was into Christ. Well, it's interesting, the comparison continues. He says, Israel also, once they were baptized, they were sustained by food in the wilderness. Look what it says in verse number three. And all ate the same spiritual food. You say, what is that talking about? Some of you who may not have grown up in church, If you were to go back to Israel's history, what you'll find is while they were in the wilderness, God provided them some supernatural food called manna. When they were in the wilderness, what had happened was they began to complain and God provided supernatural bread. If you're interested in just... I'm turning to Exodus chapter 9, oh, excuse me, Exodus 16. Let me read to you. And if you want to follow along, in Exodus 16, verse 2, it says this. And the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the people of Israel said to them, Would that we have died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the meat pots. And ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out of this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Verse 4, then the Lord said to Moses, behold, I am about to rain bread from heaven for you. And the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. Now notice it says it was spiritual bread. That refers to the origin of it. It was from God. That bread didn't just show up because wonder bread dropped the brunch in the wilderness. Okay, 
God did it. And every morning it was supplied to them. In fact, it, was, it continued for 40 years. He also refers to this spiritual drink. Look what it says in verse 4 of 1 Corinthians 10. It says, and they all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. So what happened? Well, here they are in the wilderness. They needed bread, and God provided it. But God also provided nourishment through water. In fact, in Exodus chapter 17, listen to what it says. Beginning in verse 1, it says, All the congregation of the people of Israel moved on from the wilderness of sin by stages according to the commandment of the Lord and encamped in Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people grumbled against Moses and said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? Is that why you did it? So Moses cried to the Lord, What shall I do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Pass on before the people taking with you some of the elders of Israel and taking your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go, behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb and you shall strike the rock and water shall come out of it and the people will drink. And you know what happened there? Literally, physically, God provided water for them in the wilderness. But you know what Paul does? He immediately, he immediately tries to move a little bit farther and beyond just the physical water. And he says this, Israel drank from a spiritual rock that followed them, Jesus Christ. And what he was saying was this, that water that was provided for you in the wilderness, guess who provided it? In the Old Testament, it said Yahweh, but you know who it was? It was Christ. Christ provided this for you. He was the one who ultimately gave it to you. Of course, what this does for us is it expands our Christology. Christ is God. He is Yahweh. But here's the question that all of us should have as you're coming to this text. Why does Paul bring up food and drink? Why is he bringing these things up? Well, it's going to get brought up again in the next chapter. In 1 Corinthians 11, so a little trailer for the future, he's going to talk about the Lord's table. He's going to make a comparison. What he's doing here is he's making a comparison and he's showing us that the old, in the Old Testament, God's people were both physically and spiritually sustained by bread and drink from Jesus Christ. And you know what it is? It is incredibly suggestive. You say, how is this suggested, Pastor Brian? I'm still not making all the connections. Well, the connection is clear. What he's doing is this. He's telling these Corinthians, you are just like your siblings. Your siblings in the Old Testament, they were baptized. Your siblings, on a regular basis, ate the bread and drank the cup. And the analogy is this. The analogy is these Corinthians, on a regular basis, were taking the Lord's table. Who provided the Lord's table for them? Who ultimately, when you and I take communion here and we eat physical bread and drink the cup, who gave that to us? Christ did. And what Paul's doing, the whole explanation is pregnant with meaning. He's saying, you Corinthians, you were all baptized just like them. 
And just like they had bread provided for them and they had water provided for them, and it's, it, I can't even begin to talk about all the, you remember the water that was provided in the wilderness? How did it get provided with that rock? They did what with it? They struck it. What he's saying is this, they received incredible blessings. They were baptized and ate from the Lord's table. And guess what? So have you. You have as well been able to do this. You boast of baptism. You boast of the Lord's table. But what happened to them? Listen to verse 5. Okay, go to verse 5. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. And you know what that is? That is a big understatement, isn't it? With most of them, they were overthrown in the wilderness. Let me just say, first of all, overthrown in the wilderness, that word overthrown is a picturesque word. And the, the, the picture here is this. Their bodies were strewn across the wilderness like a battlefield. Some of you have looked at ancient battlefields, or you could say even in our past history, when you, you see pictures of Gettysburg or Antietam, you see pictures of World War II, and you see battlefields where the bodies are just spread across it. What he's doing is he's painting that picture. He says, here were all of your brothers and sisters who had gone through all the same spiritual rites as you did. But look at them. They're sprawled across the wilderness. In fact, one calculated the amount of death that took place during the wilderness wanderings. If there were that many people in the wilderness during those years of wandering, one person calculated this way. It would be seven funerals an hour during daylight hours for 38 years. And you know what do, what's happening here? Paul is warning them about how God deals with his people. They were physically and spiritually recipients of God's gifts and presence, but were walking displeasing to God. And the result was they were scattered in the wilderness. They were like my friend on the casino floor. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, in fact, in the next chapter, he says, there's a lot of you who are taking communion and you're doing it unworthily. For this reason, many are sick among you and many sleep. And that idea of sleep is this. It wasn't like you're going to have an afternoon nap. This was, this is the reason that some of you are dead. Why people have died within your congregation, it's because you are living undiscerningly of what God has done for you. What's Paul getting at? He's getting at this. You may have been baptized. Okay, I'm looking at probably a majority of you in this room. You have followed the Lord in baptism. Some of you, in fact, have been baptized in that baptismal pool. And you have taken the Lord's table like you do every first Sunday of the month. Some of you haven't missed it for years. But you can walk and do all of those motions. And did you know that you and I have the capacity to live our lives displeasing to God? Just because you have affirmed Jesus... Just because he has been claimed to be your savior doesn't mean that you're all off scot-free and you can do whatever you want. Here was a group of people who had been baptized into Moses, had had spiritual refreshment, but with most of them, God was not pleased. And I can't help but think of Lebanon Baptist Church that I can have a whole group of congregation, I can have 300 to 400 people in here who many of you have been baptized and take the Lord's table and God would be saying the same thing to this church. But with most of you, I am not pleased. You may have gone through all the spiritual motions, but God's not pleased with the way you're living right now. For Israel, all but two of them who were over 40 when they got to the banks of the Jordan were killed. 
Now, that doesn't mean that all of them walked unworthily. We know that not to be the case. We know that Moses, yeah, he made some mistakes, but he wasn't able to go in. But I'm telling you, no doubt the church that he's writing here in Corinth, there was no doubt many boasting that they were in Christ, but they were very prideful and thought, hey, I'm good. Hey, I got Jesus. I got, I got my security blanket. I'm going to heaven one day. And there are some of you who do this. Hey, he's forgiven me of all my sin. I'm on my way to glory one day. So I can just take it easy and live the way I want to live. And that is wrong thinking. There were many of them who were taking advantage of their freedom that they had in Christ to go back to their sin. And Paul will tell them, you better take heed lest you what? You fall. If you think you're okay, you better beware. It's almost like your kids are crossing the creek on the stones. Dad, I'm okay. Whoa! You think you got the, the sure footing and all of a sudden you lost it. Let me tell you, there's a lot of you in this room, myself included, who often think we're okay, I'm making it, I'm good. But the Bible says this, all of you, those of you who are the most self-confident and say, hey, I'm doing great, you are the one who better takes heed lest you fall. Just because you've gone through all the motions as a believer doesn't mean you are to let your guard down. You must learn from those who became, came before you. Even though you've been rescued, you can all mess up royally. All of us can. Now, does this mean, and so a question may be coming to some of your mind right now. Does this mean that you're saying, Pastor Brian, that I could lose my salvation? That I who have come to Christ can all of a sudden like lose it and be destroyed? Are you saying that, Pastor Brian? Well, I have taught from this pulpit that those who have truly come to Jesus through repentance and faith will persevere to the end. But your walk, your life will authenticate whether your confession is true. And what we'll find is this, there were some who never actually were saved. There, were, there are going to be numbers, no doubt, who have gone through that baptismal pool, who have taken from this communion table, who, like it says in Matthew chapter 7, will say, didn't we do many good works? Didn't we work in VBS? Didn't we help in Sunday school? I taught a Sunday school class. Didn't I go on a mission trip in 2019 to Texas? I've done all these things. And many of them will say, I've done all these good things. He says, depart from me. I never what? I never knew you. I believe that there are so many who live in the cultural south that are what I would call cultural Christians. Who just go through the motions, but you know what? By your, their fruits you shall what? By their fruits you shall know them. Your life will dictate, and I'll tell you this, God knows what you do. This church may not know all that you do, but God does. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. And I'll state it this way. Those who have repented and turned to Jesus, you know what they do? They keep repenting and they keep turning to Jesus. What has actually started on a, on a day for you has continued through your life. You keep confessing. You choose, I'm not going to live my life for myself. This is not a license to sin. But what this means, when Jesus Christ gives you freedom in Christ, you now have a license to live for Jesus with your whole life, every bit of it. I now have the freedom to live all out for him, no longer for myself. That's Christian liberty. Not to live the way I want to live, it's to live for him. So Paul gives a history lesson to them. And that history lesson is to jolt them from their spiritual slumber. But now what he does is he moves to warning them. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to warn you in two ways. 
I'm going to finish the other two next week and then give you the encouragement. But I would like to start with this warning. So number two, let's warn. Look what he says in verse number six. He says, now these things took place as examples for us. And here it is. That we might not desire evil as they did. So what he's doing is this. He's, Paul is telling them that these events took place. You know why? So that they would be examples to you. They are signs to you. It's like when, I, like when I went to the Grand Canyon. There have been people who've made mistakes at the Grand Canyon, and so you know what? They're signs. Don't do this. Don't do this. Now, they're not posted every mile, okay? But they're in strategic spots. Do not. Let me tell you, all of these signs are for your good. They're for your instruction and for your learning so that you don't go off the cliff like they did. And what do you need to learn, he says? You need to learn not to desire evil as they did. And I'll tell you, that's tough. Because I'll tell you this, I have a flesh that really likes to do what? Desire evil. And when God came and saved me and his spirit came to live inside of me, he came to push me toward Christ's likeness, but I still have this spirit incarcerated in my flesh. And that flesh, if I continue to give into it and desire it, it can destroy me. And what happened to this group of people is they lusted after evil. They were given grace, but they pursued evil. And you know what? These Corinthians who he's writing to were falling for the same trick. They were going after evil. We so often, we see it in other people, but we don't see it in ourselves. Oh, that person's going after evil, but you know, we're all tempted to do it. It's almost like you're hiking, and you're going through a bunch of briars, and you can see all the briars that ended up on the person in front of you's back. Oh, you got all these things. And they say, turn around. And it's like they're all over you. And you're like, I had no idea. In the same way, he says, you better be careful because you know what? Some of us are desiring evil. Our flesh is so prone to return back to evil. We who are delivered from sin must not return back to it. I'm telling you, I see it so often. Those of us who get saved, and you remember when you first got saved, it's like, man, I got to get all these things out of my life. I got this, 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 this. I remember living in Milwaukee. And people who were saved out of the partying scene. They're like, oh man, I, I want to live for the Christ. But once they experience grace and they understand forgiveness, you know what they start to do sometimes? Hmm. Can I do this again? Hmm. And what they do is they start to desire evil again. And I'll tell you this, it'll destroy you. Sin will eat you for lunch. For the, what does the Bible say? Be sober and vigilant because your adversary, the devil, walketh about seeking whom he may what? Devour. Paul warns of four arenas that Israel desired evil, and I have found that they are the same four so often that we desire it. They're found in verse 7, 8, 9 and 10. It's interesting. They each start with a command. So if you're trying to like, if you want like an outline to just fall out in front of you, this is it. He gives the command and he always says this. He's, he gives the command and then he says, and some of the, or as some of them did. And then he gives a reference to an Old Testament event. So once again, he gives the command. He says, as some of them did. And then he gives an Old Testament event. Look, look what it says in verse 7. It says this. Do not be idolaters as some of them did. As it is written. And here's the Old Testament event. The people who sat down to eat and drink and they rose up to play. And what you'll find in each of these four categories, these categories were common sins as well in Corinth. 
and their common sins in Roswell. And the first is this. The first warning is flee idolatry. Don't worship anything other than God himself. God alone deserves your worship. He deserves your full, undivided allegiance. In fact, he says, do not commit idolatry as many of them did. And then he gives this quote, as it is written. You know what this is? This is a quote from a story in the Old Testament. It's found in Exodus 32. Let me read to you what's happening in Exodus 32. Many of you know they had uh, come from Egypt. They were now in the wilderness. They'd come to Mount Sinai. God is now giving the law to Moses on Mount Sinai, but he's delayed up there. It's taken some additional time. And so while he is delayed up there, something happens. Listen to what it says. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron. And they said to him, up, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So Aaron said to them, take off the rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives, your sons and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron, and he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. And they said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, tomorrow shall be a feast. Now interesting, it'll be a feast to the Lord. And if you notice, anytime you see the Lord in all capital letters in your English translation, that is the name, God's covenant name, Yahweh. This will be a feast to Yahweh. And they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And here's the quote. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. So what's happening? Moses is receiving the law. He's delayed. They doubted and they built this golden calf. And what do they do? They return back to their former life and they dilute the worship of Yahweh. Did you notice as again, the feast was to Yahweh. They're basically saying, I can praise God, but I can live the old way of life. I can go back to all of what I used to do. They were living their life divided with God and with who? With me. Notice they feasted and played. You know what that idea of play? It wasn't like they got board games out. It wasn't like, oh, let's get Settlers of Catan, get, get Monopoly out, let's do this. You know what the play was? The play was a euphemism for sexual debauchery. It was a euphemism. I mean, what would we say today? It's partying. Let's get up and party. Why is, why is Paul bringing that up right here? He's writing to the Corinthians, and the Corinthians had idolatry right at their doorstep. In fact, there were numbers of idol temples. And what was surrounded, surrounding the worship of idols? Eat, drinking, and immorality. And you know what a lot of them were doing? This is what they were doing. I've been saved. He's forgiven me of all my sin. I know that these idols aren't real. But you know what? Can I just go back to the partying? And doing what they do? What happened to these particular people? Well, many of them, of course, you see the judgment of God upon them. Now, for you and I in Roswell in 2019, we may not have physical 
idol worship here in Roswell. But you know what? We have idolatry all over. What divides your allegiance from King Jesus? What of your former lifestyle are you craving in subtly or blatantly returning back to? Jesus said that you can only serve how many masters? You can only serve three masters. No, he said you can only serve how many? One master. Is King Jesus your king? There are many things that can become our idols, that can become our affections and our love. It can be my stuff. All my stuff becomes where I give, get my happiness and joy. My house, it can become your idol. My kids, my kids can become my idol. Your spouse can become your idol. Your body, all you do is just try to work, take care of this body. Yes, take care of your body, but is it more important to you and do you invest more money in its sustaining than you do for King Jesus? Is it music that's become your idol? That's just simply a gift that you ought to use to worship him, but has it become, have you elevated it? What about that hobby that you spend all your time doing? You know what? Some of us, oh, I'm about to reach to my pocket to grab my phone. I left it on the front. So many of us that worship that, it dominates our time. It sucks our life away from Jesus and from living for his glory. Has it become your idol? What do you think about the most? What do you live for? What do you give the most time driving at? What do you like to surf on? Your job can be your idol. Your online reputation can be your idol. Relaxation can become your idol. Money can become your idol. Pleasure. Is everything about living for Jesus? What has become your chief joy? What gets you up in the morning? Oh, I can't wait for this. Is it Jesus? Let me suggest to you that some of you have a whole lot more idols than some of the Corinthians had. And you are worshiping at them. And God is not pleased. What does he want us to do? He wants us to run away from our idols. Now, I'm not talking about running away from your family. You know that. But he wants you to put them back in their proper lower shelf and recommit your life to King Jesus. What does Moses do? He grinds up the golden calf. Where is your allegiance? Where was the last time you just cried for Jesus? God, it's all you. Remember that song, what am I committed to? A man or worthy cause, a godly institution or brotherly applause. I lay aside what might seem good for something that is best. Commitment to the Savior true. That's when I pass the test. Is it him? Is he your allegiance? Is he what you're living for? Why am I telling you this? I don't want you to waste your life. Because all of these things are passing away. Live for him. One other area that I want to talk to you about that they desired evil. Not just idolatry. But I'll finish with this. Verse 8. It says this, we must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did, and 20,000 fell in a single day. You know, what does this refer to? This refers back to another Old Testament story in the book of Numbers. Let me read to you in Numbers chapter uh, 25, if you're interested in turning there. In Numbers 25, we read about what happened. When it comes to sexual immorality, it says this, 
While Israel lived at Chittim, the people began to whore with the daughters of Moab. These invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel yoked himself to Baal of Peor, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. Now, just so you know, this is all preferenced. If you were to read that story in context, it's preferenced by a false prophet named Balaam who was trying to curse Israel, and every time he tried, he couldn't. God wouldn't allow him to it to do it. So what does he do? He counsels the leader of Moab. He says, I know how you're going to trip God's people up, and the way you're going to do it is through sex. Advertise to them. Get their men to give in to it. Get their people to give in to it. And what happens? Sex ensnared the children of Israel. And the Bible says that 23,000 died on a single day. I'll tell you, the people he's writing to in Corinth, of course, Paul is saying, hey, remember back there, they struggled with sex? And it destroyed a number of them? Let me remind you about Corinth in your day right now. And if you were to look around Corinth, Corinth had sexual temptation everywhere. But what do we know? We know that God's plan for sex is strictly for marriage between a man and a woman, a husband and a wife. Corinth was known for its sexual promiscuity. Some of the congregation, in fact, they thought that they could come to church and sit there on Sunday, listen to the message, okay? And then on Monday, they could go to the harlot's house and have sex. You read about that earlier. Hey, I've been forgiven, I'm okay. And what, what Paul is saying is this. Your brothers and sisters who are above you, they gave into sex and guess what? 23,000 of them died in a day. And I'm telling you, if you mess with it, it'll destroy. Yes, Jesus has forgiven me of my sin. But it doesn't mean that I can go right back to it. You know what? Many of us think that we can flirt with sexual immorality and, and not be burned. But what does the Bible say? Can man take fire into his bosom and not be burned? You can't. And I'll tell you this, it's not simply the act. It's your thoughts. What did Jesus say? You have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery, the act. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her, hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. And you don't have to have a Playboy magazine to do that. You can do that in a park. You can do that in a church. You can do that anywhere. And you're not supposed to, the Bible says, flee from it. It will destroy your life. The nation of Israel, they were, spr they were strewn across the wilderness. And what did it to a lot of them? It was sex. It was their desire for it. Your liberty in Christ doesn't allow you to do this. And we flirt with it. We flirt by watching it, by viewing it. Sexual immorality has no place in your life. And you ought to run from it. In fact, in Proverbs chapter 5, listen to what it says in Proverbs chapter 5 when it talks about sexual sin of a man who was giving into it. In Proverbs chapter 5, in fact, I have it on the screen here. It says this, here's a man who was giving into sexual sin. It says, and at the end of your life, you groan when your flesh and body are consumed. Now, some have said, you know what this could be? This is a touch on even sexual diseases. If you continue to live that free in your life. And you say, and this is what you'll say one day, how have I hated dis discipline? 
and my heart despised reproof. I did not listen to the voice of my teachers. Some of you are going to remember this sermon. Why didn't I listen to Pastor Brian when he said, stay away from it? I did not listen to the voice of my teachers or incline my ears to my instructors. I am at the brink of utter ruin in the assembled congregation. And some of you, I would hate for you one day to stand before us during church discipline or having to repent. I am ashamed in front of the the congregation because I've given myself to this. Listen to what he says later in the book of Proverbs. For a man's ways are before the eyes of the Lord. And I'll tell you this, you may be able to delete your history, but I'll tell you this, God knows everything that you viewed. For a man's ways are before the eyes of the Lord, and he ponders all his past. The iniquities of the wicked ensnare him, and he is held fast in the cords of his sin. He dies for lack of discipline, and because of his great folly, he is led astray. Run from sexual immorality. Parents, If you're a parent in this room, you teach your kids how to stay pure and save themselves from marriage. Help them to learn how to guard themselves from any sexual sin. You and I live in an entertainment culture. And I'll tell you this, we may not permit the acts in our lives, but if we continue to replay it and allow it to be seen among us. Remember Lot? Lot lived in Sodom. And the Bible says he vexed his righteous soul daily by seeing their unrighteous acts. You know what? Even in my own life, I just was thinking, God, I need to be repulsed by sexual immorality in every facet. Because it'll destroy me and my church. We've got to run from it, flee from it. That means it may mean don't watch the movie. Read the plugged in report from Focus on the Family and say, you know what? It has some of that. I'm not going to watch it. And it's okay if you hadn't seen all the movies. It's okay if you don't finish that binge watching series because you know what? You're going to fill your mind with other things that are going to be pure, just, honest, lovely, of good report. If there be any virtue and if there be any praise, you're going to think on those things. Because those things really don't count when it comes to eternity. You know, an example of this Corinthian philosophy of sexual license played out was played out this week in a television show called The Bachelorette. Fox News, in fact, I read this on Fox News, reported that Hannah Brown who is the bachelorette right now, claims to be a Christian, but lives very sexually what? Free. She says, God understands that I mess up. He understands that I'm just a hot mess. I'm I'm, I'm being a little liberal in my quotes, but as I read what she had said, he understands that I'm a hot mess, she says. Don't get on to me. And let me remind you, God does forgive us of our sins. But he doesn't give us a license to live like a hot mess and live in our sin. He says, but the sexual immoral, and he goes through the list, shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. You can be involved in that, but believers, we turn from it. We turn to Christ who forgives us and who offers so much better drink. Drink waters for your own sister, your own spouse, and not from another. Marriage is honorable and all in the bed undefiled, but adulterers, God will judge. This, that type of lifestyle is the lifestyle of an unbeliever. This is why in Israel's time, their bodies were strewn across the wilderness. And I believe it's one of the reasons why so much is not done for Jesus. And so, mo- so some never move forward in their spiritual lives. Why? Because they feed on their sexual sin. 
Dating couples, if you're dating in here or you're engaged, you better put safeguards in your life to keep from getting involved in this. This is wrong. Protect yourself on the internet. Turn off the TV. It may mean that you go to the park rather than go to the movie. And maybe even at the park you'll get to talk to somebody. But it also means this, if you failed, because I'm looking at a bunch of failures in this room. We all have failed. If we confess our sins, he's what? He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from what? All unrighteousness. And I don't know where you're at today. I don't know how deeply you're caught into sin, but let me tell you, Jesus is the way out. He can help you. He can change you. And that's what the encouragement that will come next week. But I want to give it to you a little bit now. He's great. He's more than enough. And some of you may be sitting there, oh, i got to give up all this. Let me tell you, there's so much more with Jesus. He is so much greater than all of this. And as a reminder, there is no stains on the pages of tomorrow. You can live for him. But you need to be warned. So we'll look at the next two areas of warning and the encouragement next week. But don't miss the important lesson from your older siblings. And it's this. You can have incredibly great blessings and freedom, but you can also destroy yourself. If you think you're okay, if you're sitting here today and says, I'm good, you better watch out. This pastor who's up here, who's preaching to you this morning, if I in any way think, let him that thinks he stands, I better watch out because all these are going to come knocking at my door. God has saved you for a reason. Don't desire idolatry. Don't live for sexual impurity. Flee from them, but flee to Jesus. Flee to him. He is so much greater. Whom am I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire more than you. My flesh and my body may fail, but you are the strength of my life. That's what life is. That's what Christians do. For in him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Christ. Let's live for him. Father, help us to be a church that lives wholeheartedly for Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to do that today, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to ask our musicians to come. I thought a proper way to end this service is for us to sing a song about, in many ways, repentance. And some of you, as I, as we sing, may God work in your heart in a special way. Mark, you come lead us in this special song. Let's all stand together. We're going to sing together, Just As I Am, Without One Plea. As I was listening to Pastor Brian speak this morning, he said something that really struck me. He says, Christians are those who have turned from sin and have put their faith and trust in Christ, but they are people who continue